Hello, anybody there? Can you hear me? So I see us on the Venueless platform now with a backup. OK, Seems good. Work. All right, so uh, I guess. Hello, anybody there? Can you hear me? All right, I'm ready to go when you are. So I see us on the Venueless platform now with a backup. OK, Seems good. Work. All right, so uh, I guess. Hello, anybody there? Can you hear me? Okay, I share the link on. I'm ready to go when you are. So I see us on the Venueless platform now. Uh, okay. So. Okay. Okay, guys. They can obviously uh, hear us. There's a time delay between the Venueless and the uh, StreamYard. It's about 20, 25 seconds. So um, they can hear me now. They can hear us now. And um, I would say we, we just start because we are already two minutes left. Um, I would remove you, Gonzalo, from the stream and just introduce now Michael Turner, who is going to talk about the intersection of geospatial open source and commerce. Thank you, Michael, for your support uh, in this hectic minutes. And um, yeah, it's an honor to introduce Michael to you because, uh, yeah, Michael was the chair of Phosphor G217 in Boston, I think. It was 217. And yeah, uh, we are really happy to hear you now. And um, yeah, it's your, it's your stage, Michael. Thanks, Tell. I appreciate it. So it, it's good to see that, um, you know, in the virtual world, I think we just had the equivalent situation of your laptop isn't talking to the projector or you can't share your screen slides or something. There, there's always something that goes wrong with the technology. And uh, we had a little hiccup with the StreamYard platform. But I'm really pleased to be here and uh, really uh, proud of the whole community um, pull, pulling this virtual conference together. It's been great so far. So. Um, those of you who know me, um, kind of my uh, passion, I've been in business my whole career, is, you know, understanding and talking about the commerce that surrounds uh, open source software, geospatial open source software, you know, essentially how do you make money, um, how do you support Phosphor G communities and give them the money they need um, in, this, in this ecosystem. So the story begins with, you know, what is what is free and open source software? You know, we if we understand what the software is and where it comes from, it helps um, present some of the opportunities. And, you know, it's much easier to explain open source software because if you look at these brands here, which are all open source projects, Firefox, Linux, WordPress, QGIS, Postgres, SQL, Android, these are all open source software tools. So they're they're well-known brands. It's not just little niche, niche stuff. Um, Things people use every day are part of this ecosystem. And uh, free and open source software is just developed differently. Um, the software is created and maintained by a group of people. Generally, there's one person who's in charge of the, the project. Um, everyone knows um, Linus Tarvald for, um, for Linux. Um, and they make the decisions and build the team who, who makes the decisions about what comes into the software and out of it. Um, and super importantly, source code is freely available uh, to use and change. So people can see what the software looks like at a code level. Generally, the software is governed by an open license. It's open and freely available, but there's some rules you, that you shouldn't abuse. And generally, software is available free of charge. It's not always the case, but most open source software can be obtained free of charge. So what kind of free are we talking about? And you know, I think these phrases have been tossed around by a lot of people um, over the years. Um, you know, one of them is, you know, it's not the free and free and open software is not free of charge. It's really about free speech. It's really about the freedom to see the source code. But the other thing is, even if you are expecting it to be free, like free and charge, it's not really free because any kind of software has some cost in maintaining it in downloading it, in getting help if you need it. Just like free puppies, someone may give you a free puppy, but
but then you're buying food and you're buying the veterinarian services and a leash and a dog bed and, and all of those kinds of things. And what's happened recently is there are many examples of open source software um, being big business. Um, who is our uh, diamond sponsor? Microsoft. Um, you know, and who's one of our gold sponsors? Google. And many, many large brands, IBM, Trimble, Esri, here, Dell, have all been important and consistent supporters of, of FosterG conferences. And again, um, you know, back in 2019, kind of the mother of all open source deals, IBM pays $34 billion for a company that's built around an open source model about presenting versions of um, Linux uh, to enterprise businesses and providing the support to do that. And one of the other things, you know, indicators of the importance of open source software has been the um, effort that, that large companies make to associate themselves with, with open source. Um, I was at a conference um, a few years back uh, that General Electric held and in their keynote speaker, the first speaker gets up and he's talking about open source software inside of GE's products, particularly for you know, ener energy grid management. You know, why is a company like, like um, GE trying to associate itself with open source? Well, A, they actually do use it, and B, it's what customers wanna hear. People understand that open source software can be very secure, open source software, um, adhere to standards in a way that commercial software doesn't, and, and, and on and on. And, you know, even in our own geospatial world, <laughs> I saw this, I kind of, um, you know, dropped my jaw when I saw this slide comment. This is Jack Dangerman at a United States a GIS conference, putting up a slide saying that ArcGIS is an open platform and highlighting open source software and open, <laughs> open this and open that. And you know, I'm not saying I believe him, but the market conditions and people's interest in open source software is um, making a guy like Jack Dangerman believe that it's important to understand and talk about open source software. So uh, open software is here and it's not going anywhere um, except up. So, um, you know, now, would like to pivot to the, the core of my talk, which is, so how, how do you make, make money in this kind of ecosystem, understanding where so open source software came from? And there are three main models, and I'll go into each of these in a little more detail in a minute or two. Um, the first is, you know, providing value-added services and support uh, to projects that use open source. The second is building a new product and maybe incorporating open source components into that, um, into that product, sort of using the analogy over here on the, the right side, where you know, you're making dinner and um, maybe some of the ingredients are organic, but one of the ingredients is open source or, or you grew it in your own backyard. It's just one of the ingredients in your product. And then the third model is um, open sourcing your own technology for your own business's benefit. So let's dive into those things a second. So, you know, Red Hat, this $34 billion company that IBM bought, and Crunchy Data, you know, a big uh, business um, that supports the Postgres uh, database, their main uh, business is providing support, providing enterprise, helping enterprises adopt those kinds of technologies. Um, the software remains free, but people spend a lot of money to implement the software, right? And potentially when needed, um, developing new features that aren't in the current version, but they need for their particular implementation. You can hire coders who will extend these, these open source projects. I think it is worth noting that um, some of you may remember a company called Boundless, which tried that model uh, for several open source products, GeoServer, Postgis and things and things like that, and you know, unfortunately, they weren't able to make a go of it. Um, they hung around for a good long time, and um, and my recollection is that uh, some of the talent and the 
end of the uh, the company was was purchased by Planet, um, who brought some of that talent over into their um, image processing stack, which is powered by open source. So the idea in this model is there's an open source foundation. There's a foundation of the building that everyone can use, but that there's work to be done and people pay for that work to put new things on top of that foundation. Um, the second example is leveraging and incorporating Phosphorgy technology to deliver products. You know, this is Phosphorgy is one of your ingredients. Um, and so what you do is you implement Phosphorgy in a way to create new products that other people will buy from you. And really, it's pretty hard to find cloud-based products that aren't using open source in, in some way, uh, whether it's Linux or Postgres or WordPress. Um, or, uh, you know, in the geo niche, uh, Postgres and uh, GDAW. And again, you know, two of our sponsors, Google you, has a ton of open source stuff I'll show in a second. And Geocat, which has created a very nice business, you know, building uh, national and regional uh, data clearing houses on a stack that's entirely open. And they get money for those services and they support those projects. And you know, Google is kind of an extreme case, but you know, we shouldn't forget that they take open source very seriously. Android is open, Kubernetes is open, the Go programming language is open, Angular is open, it's, et cetera, et cetera. And they put these things out there and they, they do manage and moderate and decide who are committers and all of those things. But they really believe in open source and, um, you know, there's plenty of, you know, don't get me wrong, um, there's plenty of things that Google does that I don't agree with, but um, but in this area, I think they really are good citizens and leaders in how you can really leverage open source in a smart way. And very much uh, to the benefit of the Phosphor G community, Google has been a consistent sponsor, I believe for every, every single conference since Barcelona 2010 and including this virtual conference in 2021. And then the, the last model is open sourcing your commercial technology. And you know, MongoDB is a, a good example of this. They developed a big data NoSQL um, you know, platform very intentionally, and they wanted to make money on it. And um, you know, sometimes you just do it for love and passion. No one uses it. Sometimes there's all kinds of so open source software that's come and gone. But having it be free, and freely available to look at the source code, lowers barriers to adoption, and over time potentially attracts uh, contributors who may be very talented and become committers and help improve your product. But really how they make their money is, is through the, the freemium model where you can get the basic product for free. If you wanna you know, muscle your way into learning MongoDB, you can go out there and get the free version. But, it, but if you like it and want to start doing more complicated stuff, um, there are advanced features that you could pay for and it's cheaper to buy them than develop them yourself. So um, that's the last example. The one other thing um, that's a little different about the Phosphor G, uh, the open source community, the FOSS community, is you know, it's important to be a good citizen. Um, there's some basic rules of the road. Um, and giving back and sharing is one of them. Um, it's part of the openness. If you can see the source code, uh, you should be grateful that you can see the source code and support the people who create it and things of that nature. Um, it is really a community. And in these kinds of communities, nobody likes people who only take. Um, there's give and there's take, and we all try and do our best on that. Um, and there are many, many ways of giving back. You don't have to be a committer and contribute code. Um, you can contribute documentation, and, um, and Angelos described this very well this morning in the keynote. Um, you can contribute your time to volunteering for conferences. Um, our moderator, Till, is volunteering his time. I'm volunteering some more time, as well as attending this to, to support this conference. And you can also contribute money. Um, hit that support QGIS button when, next time you download the new version. Give them 10 bucks makes a difference. So um, I think I have a few minutes left and just want to 
finish with you know two examples of of how this works. Uh, one is a very small company, my friend uh, Randy Hale. Um, I hope he's uh, watching or will watch this later. I was speaking to him yesterday. He was giving a QGIS workshop. Um, and he's one of these guys who's in the value add commerce model. He trains people to do QGIS. He gets money for that. He finds customers who are sick and tired of expensive commercial software, and he helps them find alternatives and then implement those kinds of in alternatives. And he's doing this in, in Tennessee, often in rural communities. And when we talk about his uh, customer, uh, Henry County, um, you know, it's a small place uh, with about 30,000 people in it. And his job was, uh, you know, the state has a requirement for uh, ne next generation 911 for each county to give the state all the addresses that might need emergency response. And um, they were using Esri and just weren't feeling they were getting value out of it. And uh, Randy worked with them to implement a different stack with Linux, QGIS, Postgres, and GeoServer. Um, he found another product, Fulcrum, another one of the sponsors of this conference who powers their solution with a lot of open technology. And, um, and they were able to get do the field work to get the new addresses with Fulcrum and then manage all of those data in an open fashion. Um, and importantly, um, the state had open standards and said, we don't care where the data comes from, just give it to us in this format, which was a perfect opening to do this. They didn't say give us an Esri shape file or a geo database. They said, give us data that looks like this. And in the end, it's um, more of a free puppies, not free beer model. Uh, the lower cost was a very big driver in, in this county's decision. And, you know, essentially what they had was desktop ArcGIS. They had a server. Um, they had some LiDAR software, and it totaled up to about close to 34,000 US dollars. And, um, and the cost uh, for Randy's services, there was no cost for the actual software. You know, they downloaded QGIS, they downloaded PostGIS. Um, they did buy uh, one copy of Fulcrum that cost $360. And then it was about $6,000 of Randy's labor to help them set it up to do the testing to make sure it worked in association with the state. And then he now gets an annual maintenance fee to help keep their versions current. If anything goes wrong, he helps them out, et cetera. And he, you know, he has a great summary. These were his slides. He, he gave me permission to use them. Free and open isn't a black box. It's supported commercially. Um, it can help your organization do important things, but it's not free. It does cost some money. Standards are your friend and help give back by supporting companies like his and maybe even giving Q just 10 bucks the next time they download it. And then the, the next example is my big giant company. And I, I won't say that um, open source moves the needle, but I have found as I've moved around in, in Hexagon, there are people who are very aware of open source software and who take it seriously. And there are a couple initiatives um, that are done. Um, our Hexagon US Federal Division uh, located in Washington, DC, uh, manages a product called Google Earth Enterprise. Google Earth, Google used to sell that. They then open sourced it, and um, and Hexagon US Fed is now the um, moderator of that project, and they do most of the commits and um, decisions about other people committing. Another division of ours, um, uh, the Hexagon Content Program, serves uh, streaming uh, imagery. And they power that streaming through GeoServer and MapServer for, for imagery tiles. And again, they contracted with certain companies. They needed certain kinds of performance enhancements or optimizations for their kind of streaming and were able to find people who could add that into the code base. And then there's also just more informal. Some of our customers have open source solutions. And if we're selling commercial software, we need the commercial software to play nice with the open solution. So it's important to have uh, people who understand both sides of the handshake. And um, so, you know, how do we give back? We, we actively manage an open source project. 
We actively contract with companies that support open source tools that we use. And um, Hexagon has been good about supporting my interest and other people's interest in attending these conferences and volunteering time to the conference ecosystem. Could we do more? Heck yes, always. But um, it's, a, it's a good start and it's uh, been an important uh, part of my, my job to have the freedom to do some of, some of this kind of work, even if it's not directly uh, related to my, my primary mission. So with that, I'd uh, like to wrap up. Uh, free and open source so software commerce is alive and well and, and growing. Uh, there are a variety of business models that fit different needs. But don't forget uh, to give back to the community and help grow this, this community. So thank you very much. Have a great time at this event. And hats off to the uh, Buenos Aires LOC and all the sponsors for for working so so very hard. Um, it's, it's really exciting in one way and also a little bit sad that we can't yet get, all get together and hopefully that'll happen next year in Italy. Thank you, Michael. Great talk. Uh, thank you very much for this bright overview about all the business model stuff. Um, I had the experience also for nearly 20 years now. Um, to the audience, a little sorry, I'm little sitting in the south of Greece and it's raining the first time since six months. So if there's some back noise, I'm really sorry, but I can't change it <laughs> because I'm sitting outside still. Uh, but that shouldn't stop us from asking questions to Michael. Um, I have the first one. Michael, you, you have talked about the business models of the open source companies, but what about the business models of open source using organizations? Maybe you can give us some ideas about that. Yeah, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good and nuanced um, question. I mean, I try to give my sense of it lens of, of Hexagon, where there are different initiatives with different people that have found open source and and part of part of it is you know the business model is doing these open source initiatives is going to help the company make money um you know when when hexagon is managing the open gee product uh product they also have an open uh, gee professional version that um they sell um, and make money off of uh, to various um, government customers. Um, when it's when it's government, it's it's a it's a harder business model. Government's just trying to um, do its mission, solve its problem, whether it's you know dispatching police vehicles or you know making the sewer pipes uh, have good maintenance or, or whatever the case may be, and. Um, and you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, in, in my home country, the United States, government is not very popular. People hate paying taxes, and so there's a lot of stress on budgets in, in many governmental agencies. And governments are trying to be as creative and cost effective as possible. And, and that's kind of their business model: is to uh, solve their problems in a good, effective way, and uh, with the limited resources that are at hand. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have one another question that popped up. Should OSGEO make it easier for users to contribute to the projects? What are your ideas about that? Uh, that that's a very good question. Um, thankfully, um, I haven't coded in a really long time, and I know that uh, no one should let me, even when in my best days, uh, be a committer to these these projects. Um, yes, I, I, you know, I think it, you know, it's, it should be made as easy and accessible as possible. It shouldn't be a question of, do you know the right person or something? At the same time, these are very important decisions. Um, you can't kind of have a free for all, uh, people need to be good, strong coders. People need to understand the project and people need to collaborate, collaborate well. Um, if you have lots of people um, 
trying to uh, trying to commit code that's not ready to be code um, because of their skill level, it it wastes it wastes time. So I don't know what the best solution is. It's that's over my head, but that would be a great a great kind of um, I'd love to see that as a, a panel discussion amongst people who who moderate projects. Uh, there should be a better way, an open way, and the, and the criteria for what you need to bring to the table to get the invitation uh, should be clear. Yeah, that's a huge field. Uh, very good question. Thank you for that. Thank you for your answer on that. I have one last question received. Um, for the next speakers, please put your questions in the question tab. But I got that one, which is, uh, what are the key limitations for companies like Hexagon using FOSS more extensively as a business model? Uh, this is my personal opinion. Uh, I can't speak on, on behalf of my company on this, but I, you know, I think people haven't spent the time to um, learn fully about the open source ecosystem. And um, there are parts of our company, the division that I'm in, uh, used to be called Intergraph Corporation, uh, was a, a giant geospatial innovator in the 1980s and 1990s. And there've been people who have been working at this company for 30 or 40 years selling commercial software. And they just, that's what they know. And they have, you know, we're a publicly traded company. They have pressure to, to create revenue, um, legitimate uh, pressure to create uh, revenue for the shareholders. And, and this is what they know. They know how to make commercial software and they haven't, um, spent the time, uh, you know, they're very busy, it's legitimate too, to understand some of the new opportunities that, that are out there. And, um, and I think, you know, and that's why I think these conferences are so important. Uh, it's why people like me who are, you know, I, every chance I get, I try and tell people uh, about uh, the possibilities within Hexagon. And you find some people who are interested in listening. You find some people who sort of say, yeah, in Europe, it's really important. More and more governments are saying we have an open first policy, um, that it's harder to sell commercial software if there's an open alternative. So how, how do we present ourselves as being friendly to open solutions and, and then selling the things that we have that may not be available in open solutions yet? So, um, it's it's just it's a long battle, and many of us have been um, just doing our best to continue the education process. It's good to know people like you, Michael, in the position. <laughs> I think so. Thank you very much, Michael, for your talk. Uh, look at the kudos in the chat. Uh